Welcome to review of the 2014 through 2018 show, Star Wars Rebels. Now, I'm going to start by telling you this was a show that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes and we'll get into some serious topics. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. There will be no spoilers in this video. I have recorded videos talking about the individual seasons of the show where I go into spoilers and the link to the playlist of them will be in the description box. Now, I have watched every single episode once and, you know, basically one or two episodes every day until today and I record this very soon after finishing basically I right after I got done watching the finale I did the video where I talk spoilers about it and yeah so you know yeah and as soon as I was done with that I started recording this now so the the plot the according to Wikipedia this takes place over a decade after episode three the wrench of the Sith progressing to, towards the events of the original Star Wars a new hope and it depicts the Galactic Empire hunting down the last of the Jedi while a fledgling rebellion against the Empire emerges we follow we especially follow the small crew of the ghost now the birth of the rebellion was supposed to be in Revenge of the Sith, but the scenes were deleted. So if you only watch the movies that have come out before the show, there's not much indication of how the Rebellion became strong enough that they could eventually successfully mount the assault to destroy the Death Star. You know, there's 20 years between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, and yeah, before, you know, this show was the first... I know there's expanded universe, but before there there wasn't any like TV show or movie that depicted it, and then this show and Rogue One was released after the second season of this show premiered. Yeah, together Rogue One and the show help fill in what what happened in those years. How did the rebellion become strong enough? And, yeah, so, you know, um, I didn't quite binge the show, but, you know, came in, in a, I guess it depends on your exact definition of, of binge, but, yeah, I would definitely say this is a show, I, I, I don't think there's been a single day where I watched more than two episodes in one day. That was probably a good idea. I think it would have, you know, if if you if you're if if you really really love it, you can you can try to binge it. But a lot of people will prefer to take a little longer. Now, uh, the words the show teaches valuable les lessons will sometimes get a very well earned primal fight or flight response. It's so often ham fisted a lot of the time. Even the children are barely tolerating how patronizing the show is being, but the show really does a great job at integrating the lessons well. Now, it does spell out what you are to take from it more than Clone Wars. And... Yes, so let's get into the writing of the show. This can actually be the first Star Wars thing you watch, which... You know, when the original trilogy was released, that was, you know, that, that was at a pace that, you know, children back then were satisfied with. But if you try to show that to a child today, that, and, and it's not like, you know, obviously the, the child is going to pick up on it if the person showing it is super in love with the, the movies. But other than that, not necessarily, and then, you know, the prequels, same thing. If you, you know, I, I was a teenager when the prequels first came out, and they appealed to me at the time. But when this show first premiered, it had been nine years since the last, you know, prequel movie released. 
yeah, you know, it's not quite a new generation, but, you know, the, the, yeah, like the younger siblings of the prequel era kids, you know, would get into to this. I would definitely say that the um, there's something near the end. Yeah, it's not really a spoiler to say that the very finale of this show, the season four finale, the last maybe couple of minutes you should only watch after watching the original trilogy. But other than that, you know, you can watch up to that point before watching the original trilogy. And yeah, the show focuses on a small group of diverse individuals from varying backgrounds teaming up to fight fascists and prove to be effective, finding strength not in sameness, but diversity. And to me, this is crucial to Star Wars. It's very original trilogy and sequel trilogy Star Wars, something I felt was lacking when a lot of battles were made up mostly of Jedi and clones. So yeah, it's one of my issues with the prequel movies. I do love Clone Wars, but I do still, I, I prefer this. So I really appreciate something Star Wars set during the prequels, you know, a potentially interesting period of Star Wars history that does this. And yeah, one thing I absolutely love about the show, it's about people we don't know the fate of, unlike many major characters of the Clone Wars show. I appreciate with the Clone Wars show, it is this thing of, you know, yeah, there's a, let's see, the, the, there's a, there's a dramatic irony, I believe it's called, to a lot of the, because we already know how a lot of this will end up, so seeing, you know, friendships that we know will shatter, for example, there's a dramatic irony to that, but when the original trilogy came out, that was, you know, there wasn't any dramatic irony. We didn't know how it was going to end. And this show, you know, yeah, there's some stuff we do know, but most of the characters that are in this, we have no idea if they will make it through this show. And even, you know, and how will they end up, you know? Will they, will they change sides, for example? But yeah, the writing... You know, the the different characters have distinct voices and personalities, and yeah, I, I know some people felt that the show, the show was too repetitive. I disagree. I felt there was enough variety there. Now, the, yeah, so the episodes of this do not start with a recap or context, you know, which the Clone Wars did. You basically have to watch all the episodes and in order to fully keep up. Now, the pilot sets up the core cast and concept really well. You'll know if you'll want to keep watching or not. Now, tonally, the early episodes are very child-friendly compared to later. I would say maybe season two, maybe halfway through season two, it gets a lot better. If you have a Disney Plus subscription and early episodes feel too child-friendly, you know, you can try to watch some late season two. And if you still really aren't feeling it, yeah, maybe the show isn't for you. And I... I I am of the opinion that not all Star Wars has to be for everyone. There's definitely some Star Wars that I'm not, you know, interested in. I remember when I was a teenager and the prequels were coming out, there was this, like, picture book that was clearly just for children that was basically retelling the events of The Phantom Menace. You know, I don't know, I, I guess for maybe in instead of the DVD or maybe for children that they felt couldn't understand watching a movie yet you know so, something like that and I didn't feel slighted by that it's it's fine you know and yes you know this is canon and uh, you know I I get being being frustrated and there are definitely some canon issues here but you know as as there is with all Star Wars prequel media. I, I, I think after a while, you just kind of got to roll with it. Personally, I would definitely say that it it has some interesting additions to the the canon, and I think a lot of the people. I'm not saying everyone, but a lot of the people who really hate the show didn't watch. Pat, like I would definitely say, season three and four. 
Like, if that's still not for you, then the show is just not for you. But, you know, I, I get it. I've, I've given up on shows that I felt like, okay, this is just not for me. And some of those shows I've been told, they get a lot better later. And I'm like, it's, it's just did not like what I saw. So I'm not telling you, you know, you're not wrong for that. I'm presenting my case. I'm not saying that you're wrong for disagreeing. Now, the ending, you know, depending on what user review you take in, some people love it, some people hate it. I gotta say, me personally, I love it. Um, I think it was pretty much perfect. The exact way to, to end it, uh, you know, it's, it's always frustrating when you watch a show that's good a lot of the way, and then the ending really lets you down. This is, this is one of the best endings to a show I've, I've seen in a while. Um, you know, The Clone Wars, depending on when you stop watching, you know, you can stop watching when it left Cartoon Network, you can stop watching af at the end of the Netflix episodes, or you can stop watching at the end of the Disney Plus episodes. You know, I don't, none of those endings hit as hard for me as the ending to this, and I do really love, you know, the... Both this show and The Clone Wars, there's not really any episode that I look to and say, I wish that wasn't there. Like, I'll, I'll grant that there are maybe some that could be called filler episodes, but yeah, I, I love them all. So, that brings us to the direction. I love the episodes, but not the four shorts. In the four shorts, which you don't have to follow, have, you don't have to watch them to follow the show. So, if the following sounds unappealing, just skip the shorts. Don't rob yourself of the show itself. The shorts, not in the show itself. The animation feels too shiny, bright. Basically, the shorts exist to introduce potential viewers to the characters, get them to watch the show if they like those characters. Honestly, I think my biggest problem with the shorts is that the characters are separated. I think in the show itself, as long as you pair the characters off with each other, they're compelling. And, you know, one of the shorts pairs off Kanan, Hera, and Chopper. You know, I, I think you need to pair them off with some of the others. Uh, you know, I... Yeah, I find the bickering annoying in the, in the shorts. And it also helps the show has more important plots than the shorts. You know, essentially the shorts, if you, if the shorts don't really get you interested in watching the show, you haven't lost anything, as an, or, you know, unless you would have ended up enjoying the show, but you didn't lose any time. It's, it's somewhat like how, you know, you can watch A New Hope. If you watch Empire Strikes Back, you gotta watch Return of the Jedi also, or the story's just not gonna be finished. It's kind of like that. The shorts don't start off a story that they don't also finish, and I think that was intentional. Now, yeah, so, some comparisons to the Clone Wars. Now, the following are, I'm gonna start with the positives, and these are positives to me, I'm not saying they're positives to everyone. So, the Jedi are not OP, but rather OT. And while both are over personal shows, rather than the focus being on the extended cast, this focus is just on the core six. Now, of course, I was not expecting the Clone Wars to be focused on six characters who don't even appear in that show. I'm getting into the weeds here. What I'm saying is, I think it works really well for the show that it's so focused on a smaller cast. Each episode, each episode leads very naturally into the next one. It's not jumping between characters, different parts of the Star Wars galaxy. Like, essentially, in the Clone Wars, like, sometimes it would jump in time. It would frequently jump between planets, between one episode and the next, and it's just... I love the show, but man, was it difficult to get a good sense of, like, contextually like how is the war going you know I like I would be more fine with it if it was a video game and each level was a different but for a show it just I, I prefer that I can that I can follow what is happening you know sometimes a while will pass without you seeing certain characters in Clone Wars and once you see them again, it's like, okay, that's not, that's not, that's unlike last time. What happened? You know, and that's something where I really felt like that, you know, this does have 
there are supporting characters that you don't see for a while. But the you know the show makes pretty clear who's extremely important and who isn't as important. Whereas the Clone Wars has a lot of really important characters that will disappear for chunks of the show. And yeah, in in the first season of this show, battles are smaller scale. We encounter less aliens, visit less planets, and let's see. Yeah. As, you know, after season one, there is more, you know, they move some away from that, but there is still a very clear focus. And rather than the seemingly endless resources and access of the Clone Wars, the crew have a moderately sized ship, a small transport ship that can dock in the larger ship, they may not travel far. I do realize that some of this is because of the limitations of the animation here, and I have a Quora quote. The style is a bit different. The main reason that it looks worse, which of course has an element of subjectivity, is that animation costs money to look good, and they spent less compared to Clone Wars. Smaller groups of people, smaller battles, less complex animation is in part a result of that. I just think that it's overall a good thing. You know, we gotta keep in mind you know, apparently what George Lucas would have liked to do with the original Star Wars trilogy was some of what he does in Revenge of the Sith. You know, like if the technology and the money and the creative control had been there for George Lucas, he would have made Revenge, you know, something similar to Revenge of the Sith right away. And I don't, as someone who doesn't really like the prequels, I don't think that would have been a good idea. You know, a lot of the a lot of the great things about the original Star Wars, the, those first two movies, comes from limitations. So, yeah, here it is. You know, I'm not saying that Disney were like, if we spend less money, it'll be a better show. They were like, if we spend less money and people don't watch it, we'll have lost less money. That's undoubtedly what's the case. But, you know, we live in a capitalist system. The only, if you're going to make a piece of art, you probably have to work within the capitalist system to, to, you know, so you do your best. And clearly, a lot of the people working on this show were not thinking about how much money they were going to make. They were thinking about making a good show. And yeah, it feels much more like the original trilogy, less like the prequel trilogy, which was too large scale to feel like Star Wars to me. And like Clone Wars, the show has a strong sense of what fascism is and how to communi communicate it to an audience partially made up of six-year-olds. There's not too many cameos by familiar faces from the trilogies. And let's see. Yeah, and and you know, where the Clone Wars like as as fascinating an experiment as I'm sure it would be, I'm not sure I would really recommend anyone to try to watch that without having watched the the three prequel movies and maybe that's also part of the point maybe they you know they were definitely making it for people who cared about the prequel trilogy star wars movies but yeah with with this show you can this can be the very first thing you can you can know nothing about star wars at all certain things are going to hit differently sure but you're not going to be confused as such which yeah, Clone Wars, not the case. Everyone in the crew has experienced tragedy. Some of them have even helped perpetrate it. And this has, of course, helped shape them, which, you know, sometimes it means they have more empathy. Sometimes it means they have less. less. Which, again, you know, some of the characters on Clone Wars are essentially just, like, perfect. And it's just like, well, you know, here's how they do things. Maybe you could do that. Whereas... On this show, there's still different people doing different things different ways, but there's more, like, I'm not saying that, to be clear, The Clone Wars has a lot of really deep characters, but it just felt more, they feel more real here, which has always been an issue with, like, Jedi are often this kind of idealized, you know, that was also an issue in the original trilogy, you know, so, yeah, but that's something that this... And, and the fact that there's not a ton of Jedi also works really well for me. I, I love Jedi, 
but I don't think they're better the more of them there are. And <clears throat> I'm sure this is in part because of the changing standards. This show has much less, possibly actually no sexism and, sexism and misogyny, which again, like, some of the major characters of Clone Wars, just such, yeah, really, really sexist, really misogynist depictions of them. And yeah, you know, this show, the, the first season of this show premiered six years after the first season of that show. So standards had changed. Now, on the negative side, compared to Clone Wars, early on, this is a bit more ADHD and less complex, and in some ways, it never gets to be as deep. It doesn't, you know, early on, doesn't trust the attention span of kids as much. Every so often, something on screen, you know, an equivalent to jinkling keys. Where the Clone Wars is heavy on quips, this one has about a third of the quips. The remaining two-thirds are made up of bickering. Eventually they ease on that, I don't know, maybe I just got used to it, but after a while it didn't bother me as much, and early on it did kind of bother me. This is less of an anthology show, this has less variety, and th this won't be a negative for everyone. Personally I prefer it, but then I like the regular episodes of this more than those of Clone Wars, where I prefer the anthology ones. And early on, a lot of the problems that the crew has are caused by their infighting. And... Yeah, the messages being spelled out more is, of course, frustrating for the viewers who are no longer children. You know, once you're a teenager, feeling like someone's treating you like a child feels like just the worst thing ever. I remember it very distinctly, so, yeah. And, yeah, so in comparison to Clone Wars, and these, this is neutral, I think roughly the same percentage filler. And, yeah, finds its footing in Season 2, so about the same. More one-offs and less arcs, and in both of them there's frequently interpersonal drama. The action scenes are driven by this rather than just being noise. Like the Clone Wars, there are some lasting status quo changes. After a while, it does get to be more dark and mature. And... Let's see... Some major and main characters start out annoying, but get better over the run of the show. I, I would say this show gets better the longer it goes, and I do maintain it starts out strong. It's just, you kind of have to suffer through the, the child-friendly aspects early on. And despite how child-friendly it can be, it does explore mature ideas such as genocide, fascism, war crimes, including abuse of prisoners of war, grieving, torture, what you do after you realize you've been manipulated into doing something awful that you can't undo, the darker aspects of resistance movements, trust, faith, the importance to people of culture and identity. And like other Star Wars before, any that has Jabba on this doesn't have Jabba, but another character... It is sadly fat phobic, and just it has just as it has been since A New Hope, the Empire loses primarily because of hubris, which is Greek for hubris. On this show, very frequently, Imperial officers will have their eyes covered because the the cap they have goes that far down. This is, of course, to make it clear we're not supposed to empathize with them; they're the enemy. And this will be broken for the ones where we're supposed to find them especially reprehensible. They'll have hateful eyes. The original trilogy, we see the same thing with Stormtroopers and Darth Vader. We almost never see their eyes. Or, you know, in the case of Vader, even face. And then I realized later on there are some rebel people who have their eyes covered. So maybe it was just a way to save on the animation budget or something. But again, I think it, it helped for the when it was Imperials. Over the course of it, it becomes more comfortable letting stuff that is tense, scary, upsetting, creepy sit with the audience instead of reassuring that it's okay immediately after. Now, sometimes it will just be like three or four seconds, but that still means a lot, you know, where like early on they they won't they're they're scared to let the the yeah, the darker stuff sit at all. They'll immediately have something funny or charming or annoying or something. Some of the Imperial officers have sideburns. I don't remember seeing that in the original trilogy, but certainly the, orig the original movie has some very 70s stuff going on, and sideburns were popular at the time. This is set before the original trilogy, so it does make sense. 
and this features the ISB, ISB, or Imperial Security Bureau, essentially the Gestapo of original trilogy Star Wars, adding even more depth to the commentary on fascism. And it's the kind of thing that there really was not room for these guys in the original trilogy. There, I, I have no idea where they would have fit in. But this is a show, there's more running time, so yeah, they have, they can do that sort of thing, and I am glad they chose to. It explores different identities, and while there isn't necessarily any character who is decidedly a trans person, it is easy to read some of them as allegory for that, especially today watching it now, and perhaps help inspire more, it can perhaps help inspire more empathy for trans people, which is extremely important as their basic human rights are under attack from conservatives. A number of times on the show, someone will examine an abandoned ship or base, etc. Always very creepy. And the crew here disguise themselves as imperial military people on a number of occasions. And this is something that we saw very briefly in A New Hope. And yeah, the... the oh, right, I... I'm only spoiling the the movies and shows that had come out before this. I'm not spoiling Rebels itself in this video, but it's very hard to talk Star Wars without spoiling at least some of them. So, yeah. And yeah, you know, in in A New Hope, we do see them briefly dress up as storm uh, pose as stormtroopers, and this show features it a lot. And again, in the original trilogy, there weren't that many places where that would have made sense. But in this show, they said, well, you know, ongoing adventures of a cell of rebels, let's have them disguised all the time. <coughs> now, let's see. Yeah, so some critic reviews. And yeah, so one person said, in too many of the episodes, the rebels are looking for something that will give them an advantage of the Empire. They make a bad plan that doesn't sound like it will work, and then while they try to work the plan, something goes wrong. In the end, they manage to get away with what they wanted in the first place, and it happens too frequently. The bad guys in Season 1 suck. The Empire struggles to do anything right. And let's see. The show tries to be a kids and an adult show at the same time, but doesn't work as neither. And yeah, for sure that is how some people feel about it. Not me. And let's see. Yeah, the the um, one person points out, you know, in season one the animation is kind of limited, but the staff can still pull off good fights, some good graphics. Voice acting is pretty neat. The voice actors did a good job, despite some of them didn't have much experience. And let's see, when the comedy fails, it indeed fails. Sometimes the jokes are very forced. And, yeah, some have said this is more Disney than Clone Wars ever got, and you can tell it was the first thing Disney made after buying Star Wars. You know, th this was... I will... get... I'll get the exact details. So, basically, this ran between 2014 and 2018, where... The Clone Wars, you know, the, the, yeah, season six hit Netflix earlier 2014 than this show hit Disney. Oh, right, originally Disney XD and now on Disney Plus. And the seventh season of Clone Wars, which was, of course, made by Disney, since by then they owned it, you know, they bought in 2012, they bought Star Wars. The, the, yeah, season seven was made in 2020, so two years after this show. And yeah, the the you can definitely tell that the the people at Disney were worried that it would scare kids. You know, that's always been something that limits the the Disney company. 
in their in their fiction is when they're when they're too afraid of of scaring kids. And of course, the standards have changed dramatically. So if today you sit down and try to watch Pinocchio or Dumbo or Bambi or something, you know. Bambi may be less so, but there is that one bit that everyone remembers, you know, which I won't spoil for those who haven't, you know, those by today's standards seem scarier than a lot of more recent stuff Disney has done, but yeah, you know, they wanted to make money off Star Wars, that was why they bought it, so here early on they were very concerned that it would be too much. <coughs> You know, it, it goes beyond just being, like, more child-friendly. It's also more Disney-fied, which I will get into a little more. Not in the... Uh, see, conservatives have ruined that. Now now we can't just say, oh, it's been Disney-fied, because now that means, oh, you know, it's progressive. When I say Disney-fied as a, as a negative, what I mean is it is... It, it doesn't necessarily have a high opinion of children. It thinks that children have to be distracted. And to be fair, that's probably, there's probably a lot of adults who show their kids Disney stuff because they themselves feel that the kids can't handle more. You know, but yeah. But yeah, you know, what are you going to do? Conservatives ruin everything. So, some Season 2 critic comments. While Star Wars Rebels is often a little cutesy, especially considering many people are trying to kill many other people, it's an animated series that wants to have a lot of fun, but is rather impressed with young people. That's becoming something we see more and more, but it isn't exactly the mainstay of the genre yet. It grows ever darker. One of the hurdles the show manages to get over exceptionally well is keeping the audience involved as the darkness looms be without becoming, well, cartoony. For those of you that haven't caught on to Rebels yet, I have to say it, must, it is a must-watch for Star Wars fans. The show's canon takes place 14 years after the events of the Revenge of the Sith, five years before A New Hope. It's similar to a lot of the franchise in that this particular series was a small group of Rebels attempting to do battle with the Galactic Empire. What makes Rebels so interesting is that this is still the fairly early stages of the Empire. They're still in the process of gaining control over the galaxy. This doesn't mean that the Rebels are playing on even footing, of course. They're still a ragtag group consisting of misfits and outcasts, but it does make things a little less certain and a lot more interesting. And, yeah, so the designs for the characters, a lot of them at least, were based on Ralph McQuarrie designs for the original trilogy. I guess even A New Hope, before they, they settled you know, so the character of Zeb here is based on the original concept for Chewbacca. And one critic says, Ralph McQuarrie designs look amazing as stills, but bad when they're in motion. And the animation lacks the shading that made Clone Wars look so cinematic, and the show is totally inconsistent. And I, I do definitely think it looks better uh, as stills than, than in motion. And, yeah, one person says, how are we supposed to care what happens on this show? We already know the outcome based on the Star Wars movies, but this is a problem for all Star Wars media that's set anywhere other than after Return of the Jedi. You know, you're cutting yourself off from a lot of incredible Star Wars content if you hold on to this viewpoint. Although I suppose it is, and you could use that to reason not watching the prequels, which I can get behind. I didn't expect this much prequel bashing, at least this early in the video. We'll we'll see how it how it goes. I do know I have some some prequel fans in my subscriber base. I don't mean to be like putting down. It's just in order to compare, although that last one was a bit gratuitous, but in order to compare this to the other Star Wars entities. <coughs> so let's get into the characters now some of the the cast for this were not like originally um, what's the word voice actors they were you know film actors that took voice roles and I do prefer when voice work goes to voice actors you know they work 
for you know very long hours have to take any work they can get rather than big Hollywood names who can pick and choose with that out of the way I do think that they do a good job here and some of them are actually you know so, yeah some of them are voice actors so critic quotes under the direction of Filoni, the characters who include two prominent female roles are encouragingly Jar Jar Frig. Count me among the cautiously optimistic. The char <laughs> right. One person says the characters are absolutely horrible. The male crew members act like poorly behaved children who are constantly arguing, fighting, and ignoring their chores. I kid you not. The female characters act more adult but often come off as annoyed mothers. The animation quality is bad to terrible. The characters in particular look really bad. One character has facial hair. I swear it looks like his sideburns are miniature wooden fences glued to his face. It's pathetic. I do agree on the on the miniature wooden fence. That was something that took some getting used to. Most of what that critic said refers to season one. It's it's no longer true in, in season two. So, Taylor Gray plays Ezra Bridger, a teenage con artist who is taken in by Kanan to be trained as a Jedi. He has serious trust issues, trouble focusing, lack of patience. He's also angry about all that he's lost, understandably. In other words, Ezra might turn to the dark side. And that is something they explore, and I found it compelling. Not everyone will, or has. Ezra's father's name is Ephraim. Ezra and Ephraim are both Hebrew names, so I really appreciate this bit of representation. Now, yes, Ezra is a Mary Sue, as annoying as that term is, way too frequently applied to female characters. Anyway, but it's not just him and Ray. Luke and Anakin are also ridiculously quick to learn Force abilities. Ezra is a way more interesting character than Luke Skywalker was in A New Hope, and both of them grow over the adventures. Overall, Luke's journey is the more interesting one, but neither character just stays static. Both start out annoying and get better, whereas Anakin starts out annoying mostly, just gets more annoying. And yeah, a number of YouTubers have said he's basically, Ezra is basically a Latin, and that's, it is definitely, like, if Disney wasn't making this show, I sincerely doubt he would be so similar to Aladdin. One of their most popular characters and one that is easy to slot into Star Wars if we're looking at like major of you know the the Disney animated films you know there's a lot of the characters that you can't just you know pick up from the movie and plop directly into something Star Wars and have it make sense but Aladdin yeah Now, Vanessa Marshall voices Hira Sindula, a Twi'lek pilot turned rebel commander. <clears throat> and, let's see. yeah, and, and Freddie Prince Jr. And, yeah, if you haven't watched this yet, no, he doesn't do the mildly annoying pretty boy thing that he did in the 90s. His voice is gruff, aged, there's a hard life behind it. He voices Kanan Jarrus. And, yeah, he, he was a Jedi Padawan, Padawan who survived the events of Order 66, Ezra's mentor leader of the Ghost Crew. And early on, he gets his lightsaber out way less frequently than prequel Jedi seen before the show, so it feels a lot more meaningful when he does. And... I, like Kanan, doesn't let Ezra get away with stuff that goes against Jedi code. I kind of felt like Anakin did that with Ahsoka Tano in Clone Wars. And his lightsaber is in two parts whenever he doesn't need to use it, which may be a sort of keeping the safety on kind of thing. It may also be, like, after Order 66, lightsabers can be tracked if they're in one piece. And, you know, early on, like, he doesn't think that he's the right person to be a Mentos. I mean, mentor. And he and Hera will sometimes bicker like an old married couple, especially bad in season one. You know, there's a part where, you know, something went wrong that he feels like wasn't his fault. And she says, you should know better. And he responds, I knew there was some way this was my fault. So, yeah. 
and at least one user review said that the show would be better if Kanan was the protagonist rather than Ezra. And I can understand where they're coming from. I would say that he is, in some ways, a more interesting character. But yeah, you know, don't don't try to tell Disney not to center on young people, you know, young young characters that a young audience, you know, maybe has an easier time identifying with. A lot of people are going to be able to, you know are and has been able to see recognize themselves in Ezra and Tia Sirkar plays Sabine Wren a young Mandalorian warrior who's fixated on art it's hard to say what she loves more spray painting or using those little sticky grenades that Mandalorians use liberally Ezra has a crush on her and she finds him annoying so she's highly competent slightly reserved and you know, in, in a lot of ways, a good role model for young women, although some people feel that they made the character too flawless, but I, uh, let's see, how much can I give away without spoiling anything? There are definitely things she has done that were wrong, and that haunts her, and she... Yeah, she doesn't always do get everything exactly right. Now, it, yes, some people criticize that Sabina's passion about art wears colorful costumes that use colors considered feminine rather than masculine and not the kind of neutral that Leia at least sometimes and Mon Mothma, you know, yeah, Leia would sometimes, Mon Mothma, pretty regularly wear white. You know, that's not seen as inherently male or, you know, masculine or feminine, but, yeah, you know, Sabine, pink, purple, bright orange, these kinds of things, and, yeah, you know, other, other female characters were neutral or toned down in Star Wars. I agree that it's different from what we've seen before, and, in my opinion, this is usually good. Franchises need to change over time in order to stay relevant, appeal to new audiences. Also, Star Wars has always been about looking out for minorities, and women are hated for feminine traits in much of the West today. You know, and for a lot of women, their self-expression, such as what they wear, the use of color, is extremely important to them. And this is something that's been, like, for a long time, you know, this show kind of tries to combat the old way of where, basically, if a woman had to be taken seriously in, a, in something action, yeah, they had to dress neutrally or dress like a man you know the the trinity in the matrix wears black same as a lot of the male characters you know the the yeah sunglasses tough exterior kind of you know that was the only way for a long time for a woman to be taken seriously as some, you know, in, in action, in, in Western media. And, yeah, this show proves that you don't have to do that. And, yeah, you know, some people say, oh, it's just to sell toys. It's to sell different, you know, sh they have her wear so many different ones to sell toys of the different ones, which there is some truth to, but they do that with male characters as well. I forget, was it... Um, it might have been Ryan George of, of Pitch Meetings, but, oh, wait, no, yeah, I think it, um, was it Cracked, maybe, in one of the Disney Owns You from Marvel, Cracked, I forget, I don't remember exactly, but somewhere recently, someone pointed out, like, I, um, do I want to give away which one? One of the Marvel, one of the MCU Spider-Man movies like, Spider-Man is wearing different costumes over and over and over, and, you know, they, yeah, they pointed out in this YouTube video, I mean, I guess we could have just had one, like, montage where he keeps wearing different ones, but no, let's just instead have him, for no reason, wear a different outfit every other, every scene or every other scene, something like that, so, you know, 
It's true, and I wish it didn't happen, but it's not unique to female characters. And let's see. And, you know, yes, so as I was saying, you know, for a lot of women, their self expression, such as what they wear, the use of color is extremely important to them. I believe that the show is exploring this in a positive way. And I wonder how many of the people who dislike this are young men who feel like women are invading Star Wars when. Women have always been important to Star Wars. On screen, as mentioned, you have Leia Mon Mothma behind the scenes. The first movie was edited by Marsha, in, in part by Marsha Lucas, George Lucas's then wife, and she in fact saved it from some of George Lucas's worst tendencies when editing. Star Wars as it is today would not exist if not for the great work of women. Stephen Bloom plays Gerazeb Zeb Aurelius and a bunch of minor characters also, Steve Bloom, Stephen Bloom does. Now, Zeb is a former Lassat Honor Guard member and rebel who wants the Empire to pay for enslaving his people. He has a staff that can be used as a rifle and also like more up-close gun and one of those fighting sticks with purple electricity at either end that we see in Revenge of the Sith used against Jedi and you know this show actually assigns meaning to it instead of it just being a kind of cool weapon you know which would be fine but I really appreciate yeah now some user reviews expressed that they really do not like the character of Zen I personally do like him but I would definitely say that he often does not live up to his potential maybe the people writing the show didn't quite know what to do with him being you know the the last survivor of his people it, you know that is legitimately a very compelling backstory and occasionally they do really deliver on that but a lot of the time he's just grumpy and somewhat physically abusive in an older brother kind of way so yeah and yeah the design of Zeb is based on Ralph McQuarrie's early concept art for Chewbacca with the addition of purple tiger stripes and Dave Filoni voices Chopper credited as himself prior to the series finale that's cute Hera's astromech droid who can be a bit reckless. Perhaps the most expressive astromech up to the point this first aired. He has sort of arms and hands so he'll he'll pose and and uh, yeah. And yeah, some some have said where R2D2 is a dog, Chopper is a cat, you know, metaphorically speaking and yeah. <coughs> There is basically a family dynamic to the crew here, and Kanan are the parents who try to be patient, easily the most responsible members. Chopper is the youngest brother who only gets attention when he causes trouble, so he does that a lot. That and when they expect him to work and don't necessarily give him enough time, so he gets annoyed, of course. Zeb is like the annoying older brother who's more likely to punch Ezra on the shoulder than say something nice and supportive. Of course, it doesn't completely work to apply this metaphor when you get to the fact that Ezra is clearly trying to get into a romantic relationship with Sabine, unless the family's from Alabama. So basically, it's a version of A New Hope if they kept going on many adventures together. Ezra is Luke if he were a small-time thief instead of a former farmer. Zeb is Chewbacca if he spoke Galactic Basic and was never cuddly. Chopper is R2-D2 if you were more of a troublemaker, and yes, though it doesn't happen immediately, there is a humanoid droid that serves as a C-3PO. No, there is definitely not as much of that character as there should be. Hera is Leia if she were a fly girl. Sabine is Han Solo if he were a teen girl and with romantic tension between Luke and Han. Kanan is Ben Kenobi if he were younger. And even if you've watched all 11 movies with these characters, we have no idea if they survive, so... I approve. Uh, to expand slightly on Hera, she is definitely somewhat like the mother of the, you know, so sometimes she gets annoyed that the others are not being as serious as the situation calls for, and yeah, it's, it's annoying that we still have a lot of major female characters that get you know, slotted into that kind of role, but she is also very capable and, yeah, you know, a, a good role model for, for young women. Now, let's see, right, so some IMDb trivia. The concept of the show is very similar to what Dave Filoni and Henry Gilroy had originally planned for Clone Wars when they assumed that Obi-Wan and Anakin would not be the main characters. Their idea was to focus 
on the crew of a Millennium Falcon-style smuggling ship consisting of a Twi'lek Jedi called Sendak, his Toguta apprentice Ashla, a Han Solo-like smuggler called Cad, his girlfriend Lupe, the Rugungan strongman Lunker, the Jedi and his Padawan became Kanan and Ezra, the smuggler pilot became Hira Syndulla, the other female character became Mandalorian Sabine Wren, and the strongman became Zeb. And... Yeah, so the visual style of the show, heavily inspired by the original Star Wars concept art by Ralph McQuarrie, so much so that even lightsabers are thinner, just like in McQuarrie's paintings, and the backgrounds are rendered in such a way that it looked like pencil lines. And, yeah, so the first season takes place 14 years after Revenge of the Sith, five years before A New Hope. Between each subsequent season and the next, there is a time jump of about six months. And, yeah, there are a number of actors and actresses who reprise their roles from Clone Wars. And I don't know if I really want to... Some of these are definitely spoilers, so I think I am going to... Hmm. Right, what I will say, Corey Burton, Clance Brown, and Nika Futterman all returned, but portrayed different characters, which is great, because they're incredibly talented. And during production of Clone Wars, George Lucas encouraged composer Kevin Kiner to experiment with many different kinds of music. For this show, Kiner decided to sample the themes and motifs from John Williams' original trilogy soundtracks much more prominently. And that's definitely something that, for some people, really didn't work for others, including myself, really did. The animated movies of Hayao Miyazaki were a major influence for this show, which you can definitely see in some of the episodes. I don't know if I want to... Some of these things show up kind of late in the show. I'll just say there are some... You can definitely see the love of nature in some episodes. That's not a spoiler. Star Wars Jedi have always been a lot about love of nature, so... But yeah, uh, for sure, the the and it was, it was really, really cool to see. Um, I've watched most of Miyazaki's work. And no, the, the um, Spirited Away is not my favorite. I'm strictly subs over dubs. Um, my, my favorite is probably A Grave of the Fireflies. Now, let's see. Mm. Right, the the despite the similarities between Ezra and Aladdin, Dave Filoni insists his inspiration was Ralph Macchio as the Karate Kid, which I mean, maybe I would you know, I did watch that movie many many years ago, it didn't do much for me. I, I do love a lot of 80s movies, just that one wasn't really my kind of thing. I definitely see more Aladdin in, in Ezra than... yeah. And Kane and Jerris was influenced by Bill Money, Clint Eastwood's character in Unforgiven. Kane is forced to return to his life, to his former life as a Jedi, former 14 years after Order 66. And... Right, so the... Yeah, um... Dave Filoni proposed to do a series without Force users, focus on fighter pilots. Eventually, Carrie Beck's idea of fo focusing on a group of heroes that were always on the run while trying to help others, like the A-Team, was chosen. In some versions, Kanan had a robot arm, Zeb was first conceived as an Ithorian hammerhead, then a large blue Snivian, Snaggletooth, instead of a concept Wookiee, Hero went from being a plump matriarch to being a young girl, combining the characters of Hero and Sabine, back to being back to the mother of the group, but this time thin. And yeah, so where Clone Wars paid homage to the original Thunderbirds, not the live action movie, the animation in this show was similar to Traditional Disney animation scene in Tangled, Frozen, and Big Hero 6. And... 
composer Kevin Kiner commented that he he bought Star Wars original score in the late 70s and since then it was a goal to compose like John Williams and the series had a premise similar to both Blake's Seven and Firefly and and yeah, you know, the the yeah, all three series were heavily inspired by A New Hope. <clears throat> now, James Earl Jones does appear some, uh, or does voice Darth Vader some, and yeah, not as much as. We would like to see, of course. David Oyelowo plays Agent Callus, an influential member of the Imperial Ground Team, who's tasked with overviewing Imperial activities. And he has the same kind of staff that Zeb has, which means he must have killed a member of the Lassat Honor Guard and taken it for him. And, you know, fascists do take the parts of others' cultures that they want to use for themselves. So, you know, he, we, we really hate this guy. It's it's a they they do a really great job with the like there there will be the same villain for a chunk of the show and you know yeah I'm I'm not gonna give away exactly who but they have some really great villains Jason Isaacs voices the Grand Inquisitor. And, uh, you know, he has red facial tattoos. It works really well to make him distinct and intimidating. If they had done a bad job, it would look like he cried red mascara and someone started to draw something obscene on his forehead and then got distracted. And... Let's see... Um, Keith Zara Baika plays Zicatro Vizago, a Devaronian crime lord, and yeah, he sometimes helps out the crew, and I don't think I want to give that character away. Uh, let's see. Yeah, D. Bradley Baker shows up to yet again, you know, just it's it's never a bad day when D. Bradley Baker is voicing something Star Wars. And Grand Moff Tarkin does appear. It's Steven Stanton voicing him. And let's see. Yeah, and, and Darth Sidious does appear, some of the time voiced by Sam Witwer, other times voiced by Ian McDermott, the OG. And, yeah, they do some really great stuff with him. Jim Cummings voices Honda Onaka, a Weequay who led a group of space pirates that operated on the Outer Rim during the Clone Wars. I have to admit, I used to find the character really fun, but I realized recently that the character is a an anti-Semitic stereotype. Uh, you know, his voice is very Semitic, and... Because, you know, yeah, they gave him the following anti-Semitic, stereotypical traits. You know, he, yeah, his deceptive nature, manipulation, including betrayal, his greed, the fact he's always trying to profit, no matter the method. You know, in real life, none of these are traits that are more prevalent among Jews. Those are just disgusting lies used to justify persecuting them. To be clear, it is not wrong to have characters in fiction have at least some of these traits. It's very useful to comment on evil, but it is wrong to code those characters as Jewish. That's when it's anti-Semitic. <clears throat> and it, it would have been easy, like, I, I do realize he was an anti-Semitic stereotype in Clone Wars as well, so I, you know, maybe they didn't want to change, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing the character again. I just hope that they, you know, give him a more white dude sounding voice. That would pretty much fix it, in in my opinion. But you know, I'm not Jewish myself, so it's not like I have a final say on it. Just sharing my opinion. 
Now, Gina Torres. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Sarah Michelle Geller, Gina Torres, and Lars Mikkelsen, you know, voice characters on this. And, you know, I, I gotta say, I, I'm not sure I've seen Sarah Michelle Geller in a lot that was like. Did that? Hold on. I guess not. Okay. <laughs> Ah, okay. Um, I don't know if I've seen Sarah Michelle Gellar in a lot that would make me think that she was like amazing. I don't have a problem with her, just but Gina Torres and Lars Mikkelsen and, and Sarah Michelle Gellar does do really well here. Um, Lars Mikkelsen, Danish like myself, always love seeing a Danish actor. You know, it it helps really show that we have talented enough actors that like. You know, it's one thing, if you were born in America and you grew up, like, there's some actors in America that just, like, I don't know, they have a famous parent, or they attended a school that got them, into, you know, but here, straight up, like, no, that's because he's that talented, you know, he got the role over Americans, you know, and, yeah, he's he's great, I'm really glad he's he does voice acting as well. This, this was the first time I saw him voice act, but... I've, uh, you know, I'm a fan of his live-action performances as well. I think he is very good in, I mean, I guess it, it there isn't that many, yes, it's called Headhunter from 2009. Quite fond of his work in that. I'm not, yeah, I don't, I haven't actually seen, oh, he was on The Witcher. The, the live-action Witcher show, very cool. And, yeah, this might act... I'm not sure I've seen him in anything else than... Oh, that's right, he's in... Uh, um, yeah, what what do y'all call that? Um, flame, flame and citron? Lemon, I guess. Citron in English is lemon. Um, yeah, so I haven't seen him in much, but he was very impressive in the things I saw. Now, um, let's see. Yeah, Tom Baker does a voice, which is also good. Wow, did not know that. But yeah, Warwick Davis does a, a voice. He does excellent. He's that that he plays a character that I I quite liked seeing. So that's yeah, very very cool. <coughs> <coughs> And there's a couple of people from the movies that are actually voiced by their the the actors who portrayed them in the movies where it is possible to do. And Tom Kane also shows up in this. Now yeah, so the dialogue, there's some frustratingly hand-holdy dialogue. Like, at one point, a character says of a place that he's spent years of his life, there's never been so many Star Destroyers here, and then they felt the need to have him followed up with things are getting worse, which most viewers glean from the previous statement. But, yeah. Um, for sure, on a bunch of the dialogue is very annoying to, yeah. That brings us to the cinematography, and they do a good job, you know, with animation, you can essentially, you know, depending on the budget, how much time you have and such, you can essentially do whatever you want with uh, the, the cinematography, you know, you can have the camera start extremely far away and slowly, get it, or, or the opposite, where, you know, if you're doing a live action and you don't have CG, you can't pull the camera any further out then technology will allow the the actual camera will allow you know and they get some good use out of this basically lack of limitation and other times you know they they do you know it's often it's a, it can be a very good idea for animation to mimic what works well in live action you know not in every single way but you know shot reverse shot and kind of the the 
uh, reaction shots to when when something important happens and that kind of thing. You know, like if you're animating, it's like I've never animated myself, but I can imagine probably more fun to animate the big cool thing but if you never go back to someone to the face of someone affected by it it's just not gonna feel it's not gonna hit as hard for the audience and they do a good job of that here editing is good uh, episodes tend to you know they, they don't tend to really just get repetitive or or not really be going anywhere which you know the fact that every episode is basically like 21 minutes, that helps a lot. That means that they do have to keep things moving. And, you know, originally this aired on TV. So if every episode doesn't get the audience invested, they know, I mean, people might not re return for the next episode and they were screwed, you know. So they, they made a clear effort to make sure every episode was really, really worked for people. And I think I've said everything I had to about the music. But yeah, Kevin Kiner, you know, very prolific composer, even outside. And yeah, so you know, in in you know, one one user review says, you know, in, in Clone Wars they only used the original soundtrack for Star Wars for highlights and here they you know yeah some people felt that it was overused here and you know I do think that the the work he did on Clone Wars was also great but yeah I I think it worked really well but you know your mileage may vary the sound design is great it's always been a key aspect of Star Wars it has to feel different it has to feel unique from our own world you know there's tons of pieces of sci-fi where you know something goes flying by and you have like a whoosh but nothing else sounds like tie fighters and x-wings and such and in addition to recreating those since you know this is set during the time where tie fighters and x-wings were prominent in addition, they bring in a bunch of new creatures and vehicles and technologies and such. And all of them sound in a, you know, they have, yeah, they sound like they belong in Star Wars. You know, tr try, and, you know, test it for yourself. Watch something Star Wars, pause it, and watch something, you know, some other sci-fi. You know, it doesn't even have to be bad sci-fi. It can be like Star Trek, you know completely different audio sound design and let's see so the yeah um that brings us to the best uh best worst and so forth the best element is the how much it feels like star wars when so much like they they were trying to redefine what star wars was to more of a prequel thing, and I really appreciate this much more original trilogy. And yeah, the worst aspect is probably the first chunk where it really does not trust the audience to pay attention if there's not constantly bickering or something weird happening or something, you know. But yeah, gets a lot better, so ultimately I don't think it's a big deal. Now, uh, so, yes, yeah, stuff that other people said they felt were big problems. Some say it wasn't needed. Some say it was too child-oriented. And for sure, I would prefer if the show was less child-oriented. But I do think this is a an interesting story to tell. The most the, the thing I was most worried about was uh, you know how how to care about characters that this introduces that don't appear in the original trilogy you know the the worry is I guess they're not important enough to even be mentioned you know but yeah the the show exceed my expectations 
was most looking forward to more Star Wars animation after loving Clone Wars. And yeah, you know, overall I do like this better than Clone Wars, but if I had to be brutally honest, yeah, Clone Wars is probably overall the better show, even though that, you know, both of them start out very child friendly. Like, if you go back and watch early Ahsoka, that was also like, wow. And she got much better, you know. But, yeah, uh, whether we're talking season opener, season finale, overall season, I feel that each season of this show got better as it went and, you know, was better than Clone Wars. Now, some there there is some stuff in trailers that gives a bit too much away, but they do also give you a decent idea of what the show is like. And some of the cover poster art also give too much away, but also give you a good idea of what the show is like. Now, the... Huh. Did I... Okay, then. I guess I forgot. Okay, I... It won't take long. We'll open the Rotten Tomatoes. And... There's, of course, other stuff called Rebels, but this is the only one called Star Wars Rebels. So overall, it has a 98 average tomato meter, an 83 average audience score. And Season 1 has a 92 Rotten Tomatoes. The other three have 100% each. And if it will stop lagging, there we go. The first season has a 76% audience score. Season 2 has 86. Season 3 has 85. And Season 4 has 86. So, fairly... Ah. What's the word? You know, it, it didn't fluctuate wildly. People like all four seasons. Not completely equally, but none of them are like completely down where others are like way up which does sometimes happen with shows now on Metacritic it has a 78 based on four critic reviews and the audience score based on 102 ratings is 7.4 on IMDB there are 42 reviews in the external reviews section I was able to read 21 of them so they were in English and not dead links and the overall rating is 8.0 out of 10 on IMDb, which compared to Clone Wars, and I gotta make sure I click on the show, not the movie. Clone Wars is 8.4. So that gives you an idea that overall people did like it. You know, the, the amount of people who really thought it was much, much lesser, you know, statistically speaking, not a huge amount. And there are 43,000 uh, IMDb user votes. 31.4% gave it 4, 21.3 gave it 10, 19.8 gave it 9, 14.7 gave it 7, 5.4 gave it 6, 2.4 gave it 5, 2.4 gave it 1. See, I would, I wish I knew if the 2.4 who gave it 1 watched past Season 1. 0 0.8 gave it 3, 0 0.6 gave it 2. I think giving it less than 5 is, is kind of harsh. Now, it won 7 nominations, was nominated for 29, and... Yeah, you know, music, uh, let's see, acting, yeah, there's, and, and, um, yeah, best overall show, yeah, it, it, uh, there was a lot. And, yeah, so the, the, the violence is not excessive to what children, you know, I th yeah, I think it is like six or seven years old is, is what the, um, 
um, yeah, what the what the um, rating TV rating would say, and that yeah, uh, age seven. That makes a lot of sense. I there, there's no part of this show that I think a seven year old absolutely couldn't handle. There might be some where you'll want to be ready to talk to them and reassure them afterwards, but there's nothing that's gonna like warp their mind. And that brings us to my rating. So yeah. Eight overall great Star Wars animated shows out of ten. And yeah, the the yeah, hit me up in the comments, let me know what is your favorite season of this or Clone Wars. And yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe hit that little bell like it's working for the Empire. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And these days, I am also doing the most recent episode of The Clearing, the most recent episode available to myself through, you know, Danish Disney Plus of True Lies, the show and the most recent episode that I've personally gotten around to watching of Scream Queens. And recently the Ruben Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video since its running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalogs. Let's catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. The Force will be with you always.